In September 1948, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, more frequently known as North Korea, was founded. North Korea's geopolitical counterpart, the Republic of Korea, also known as South Korea, was founded one month prior. The two Korean nations were precariously divided along the 38th parallel line following the end of the Japanese colonial period. In addition to possessing ideologically opposed governments representing the Cold War interests, of the two mid-20th century superpowers respectively, with North Korea firmly under the hegemonic bloc of the Soviet Union, whilst on the other hand, South Korea was firmly under the hegemonic bloc of the United States. Both Korean states claimed to be the rightful successors to rulership across the Korean Peninsula. After a series of border clashes and socio-political purges across the two Korean nations, the Korean People's Army of North Korea launched a full-scale invasion of South Korea on the 25th of June 1950, capturing the South Korean capital of Seoul on the 28th of June 1950. The war would allure the military powers of the United States, the United Nations, China and even the Soviet Union who assisted in air power to North Korea. With over three years of conflict on the Korean Peninsula, the tide of war fluctuated remarkably between the capitalist and communist blocs, as the city of Seoul was witness to four transfers of power and five battles overall. The current border between North and South Korea is the line from which the Armistice Agreement signed on the 27th of July 1953 enforced a ceasefire and the demilitarized zone was subsequently established. The Korean War not only shaped the Korean Peninsula, but also shaped the 20th century superpowers, the means of warfare and geopolitics, and world history overall. Roughly 3 million Korean civilians perished as a result of the conflict, along with families divided across the border. The Korean War, however, is still officially ongoing, with the initial ceasefire still maintaining a passive conflict. With the blessing of the Soviet Union and China, Kim Il-sung and the Workers' Party of Korea inherited the government of North Korea, while Syngman Rhee and the Liberal Party, with the blessing of the United States, inherited the government of South Korea. The North Korean state, which was initially established on the principles of Marxism-Leninism, brought forth from the Soviet Union and Korean revolutionaries alike, underwent profound ideological transformation throughout the mid to late 20th century, following its geopolitical break with the Soviet Union. The process of ideological transformation was accelerated by the political purges of the Kim Il-sung regime during the 1950s, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, and the devastating North Korean famine that subsequently followed it of which up to 3.5 million people are estimated to have died. As of the present day, the North Korean state is characterized by its economic isolationism, militarism, 20th century aestheticism, and its one-party state rule, which is enticed with seemingly religious characteristics for a otherwise atheist state. Historically speaking, the distinctions between political and religious domains have been largely undifferentiated throughout history, with the explicit deification of rulers dating as far back as the early Egyptian pharaohs in the 4th millennium BCE. In more recent centuries, European monarchs had been endowed with the divine right of kings, providing a metaphysical justification for the basis of their rule. Italian historian Emilio Gentile argues the contemporary notion of political religion, however, does not require a distinct eschatological or theological framework in order to operate. On the subject at hand, Gentile, in his book Politics as Religion, states, Political religions belong to a more general phenomenon, secular religion. This term describes a more or less developed system of beliefs, myths, rituals, and symbols that create an aura of sacredness around an entity belonging to this world and turn it into a cult and an object of worship and devotion. For Gentile, the unsettled distinction between religion and politics as a field of study was most notably recognized by French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau during the Enlightenment period of the 18th century of which Rousseau perceived religion as a means to cement state authority from which a democratic social contract of the people could be realized. Considering the framework of Rousseau, the binding of religion and politics is by no means entirely attributed to authoritarian or totalitarian societies, nor is it necessarily utilized to meet undemocratic ends. As the authors of Political Religion Beyond Totalitarianism state in their book, religiosity lies at the heart of modern politics. Any agent in modern politics, be it states, parties, politicians, pressure groups or newspapers, simply had to appeal to the masses and win their hearts and minds. This was done through messages that often used religious forms and language, 
providing meaning, coherence, identity, myths, rituals, and a clear distinction between good and evil. Increasingly, politics came to resemble belief systems which claimed to explain the purpose of human existence, thus creating what has been termed a secular religion. Veneration and sacralization became a characteristic of all forms of modern politics. In this sense, the indefinite distinction between religion and politics is not unique to undemocratic or unsecular societies alone, but rather simply more excessive as seen in the totalitarian regimes of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. In contrast to the civil religion of Rousseauian thought, the study of political religions have since paved way for more modern approaches to understanding the relationship between religious sacrilege and political power. Common features of political religion found within the 20th century totalitarian regimes were that of transcendent leadership, manichaeistic power struggles, visions of a promised future, and public rituals for a political community with clear insider and outsider distinctions. Unlike the two prime totalitarian states of Europe, the North Korean state has since lingered into the 21st century, and in spite of the nation's adherence to atheism and modern science, strong currents of pre-modern Confucian ruler worship and dynasticism persist. The current ruling state ideology of North Korea is called Juche ideology, which is generally defined as an ideology of self-reliance, self-determination or autonomy in a post-colonial era. However, there is far greater nuance in the etymological origins of the two traditional characters which constitute the word Juche. The first traditional Chinese character being Zhu, which means the primary principle or master, and the second traditional Chinese character being Ti, which means body, self, form and or essence. Together they establish the word Juche. In Korean, Juche is also referred to as Juche Sasang, which means Juche thought, which emphasizes the idealist and intellectual development of the ideology. Additionally, it is also referred to as Juche Song, which in a geopolitical and historical context emphasizes the sovereign autonomy of the Korean people and their separation from historically paying tribute to a greater imperial power, notably China and the Japanese Empire. As Lee yuk the editor of the book called Juche, the speeches and writings of Kim Il-sung states in the introduction to the book, Establishing Juche means, in short, being the master of revolution and reconstruction in one's own country. This means holding fast to an independent position, rejecting dependence on others, using one's mind, believing in one's strength, displaying the revolutionary spirit of self-reliance, and thus solving one's own problems for oneself on one's own responsibility under all circumstances. Whilst Juche ideology largely originated from Korean conceptions of self-mastery and self-destiny in German idealist philosophy, Kim Il-sung, who was the first supreme leader of the North Korean state, is nonetheless largely considered the founding father of the ideology. Following the preservation of the self-proclaimed communist state in the aftermath of the Korean War, the Kim Il-sung regime underwent intellectual development in expanding the post-colonial ideas of political independence, economic self-sufficiency, and military self-reliance in the framework of Marxism-Leninism. In these early years, the North Korean state established a Soviet-influenced form of nationalism, which distinguished the liberated and worker-revolutionary North from the perceived fascistic and economically destitute and dependent South. However, the pro-Soviet stance of Kim Il-sung which saw the Soviet Union as a vehicle for achieving revolution on the Korean Peninsula, was later abandoned following the death of Stalin in 1953 and the reforms of Khrushchev in subsequent years, which threatened Stalinist-based notions of leadership in North Korea. We are not conducting the revolution of any other country but our own Joseon Revolution. In order to carry out the Joseon Revolution, we must first know Joseon history, Joseon geography, and Joseon customs. The diminishing role of the Soviet Union as a main proponent of Korean liberation lay the foundations for a more cultural and ethnocentric sense of national identity within the perceived revolution of the Workers' Party of Korea. Hints of anti-foreign sentiment that existed in North Korea at this time were not so much the products of a perceived sense of national supremacy, but rather the products of a vulnerable governing class who conjured beliefs that counter-revolutionaries and opponents of the Kim Il-sung regime were colluding with foreign powers to undermine the revolutionary government. In Juche's early formational years of the 1950s, the ideology came to present itself as a Stalinist-orientated political bloc which stood in opposition to the democratic socialist movements and to factions within the Workers' Party of Korea, which did not align themselves to the authority of Kim Il-sung. Historian and political scientist Chris Springer states that 
the North Korean state in the 1950s was still a work in progress, as was Kim's authority. Though he was firmly affixed at the apex of the leadership, he still shared the stage with others. His rule was not yet monolithic, much less dynamic, and his cult of personality had not yet expanded into ritualistic, quasi-religious veneration. In order to push his policies through, Kim publicly vilified competing factions of the party. He accused his opponents of being anti-party, counter-revolutionary factionalists. And indeed, Kim had several of his rivals physically eliminated. His vengeance culminated in the purges of 1956 to 1958. Those who opposed the authority of Kim Il-sung largely did so on the grounds of his anti-democratic tendencies. The economic priority he gave to heavy industries at the expense of largely rural living standards and his inter-party cronyism. Kim Il-sung, however, had large support for his time and outnumbered his opposition, to the point of either expelling dissident party members or, in the worst case, expunging them. Those who were purged and murdered by the Kim Il-sung regime included the prominent Korean independence leader Choi Chang-ik and the former head of state Kim Tu-bong. The second phase of Juche's development came in the 1960s, when intellectual development in the ideology assorted new principles of political independence, Chaju, economic self-reliance, Charip, and self-defense, Chawi. A further principle of supreme or eternal leadership, Suryong, was also conceived to justify the ruling party leading the will of the Korean people in the efforts to materialize the revolution. The development of Juche at this point acquired a theoretical and philosophical framework which was declared to be aligned to the cultural and geographical realities of the Korean people. At this stage, the state and party had become one monolithic whole, from which Marxist-Leninist ideas underwent redevelopment in order to maintain the supposedly natural hierarchy and hegemony of Kim Il-sung and the Workers' Party of Korea. By the 1970s, the third phase of Juche's development conceived of an entirely separate ideological system from its original predecessor, Marxism-Leninism, with a logic and methodology of its own making. In 1972, the Supreme People's Assembly adopted a new constitution which declared the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to be an independent socialist state, with Juche as its guiding ideology, along with Kim Il-sung officially elected as president in addition to being the supreme leader. The consolidation of Juche as a distinct ideology was affirmed by Kim Il-sung's son, Kim Jong-il, in his book called On the Juche Idea, of which he declares the foundations of Juche to be predicated upon the philosophical thought of Kim Il-sung and his extended family. Korean studies scholar and historian Chung Yong soon states, From this point on, Juche ideology transformed itself from a mere response to and a way of achieving independence from foreign powers into a structural logic dominating the lives of a group of humanity. In the late 20th century, the framework which established Juche was no longer perceived as foreign or external, but rather understood as a continuation of indigenous Korean ideals which were actualized through the revolutionary struggle of Kim Il-sung and later Kim Jong-il. Through this conception, the North Korean state and its bureaucratic hierarchy are supposedly modern and scientifically informed incarnations of Korea's native and former Joseon dynasty. The close development of Juche ideology to Kim Il-sung and later Kim Jong-il has additionally conjured the terms Kim Il-sungism and Kim Jong-ilism, which can be used somewhat interchangeably with Juche. The most recent development in the ideology of Juche was conceived in the wake of the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991, which tragically resulted in the North Korean famine from roughly 1994 until 1998. As the former American government researcher Robert Warden declared, under the best weather conditions, the climate in North Korea allows only one growing season, from June to October, and some experts estimate that even in normal times, North Korea would have a 12% shortfall in the grain production required to feed its people. Before the division of the peninsula, the northern half imported food from the more fertile south. With the division of the peninsula, North Korea attempted to be self-sufficient in food production, a largely unattainable goal. The famine in the mid-1990s was a result of both systemic and proximate causes. By the early 1990s, there was clear evidence of a severe decline across the entire North Korean economy. Having lost the Soviet Union and China as major subsidy providers, the economy began to falter. In particular, the loss of agricultural subsidies and fertilizer and energy imports from the Soviet Union and China had an immediate impact on agricultural output. In drastic contrast to the principles of Juche, 
North Korea in the late 20th century was still largely reliant on the Soviet Union for economic aid and cheap imports of petroleum to fuel the technology necessary to maintain agricultural production across the country. When the Soviet Union collapsed, so too did North Korean agricultural development, initiating the largest mass starvation event on Korean soil. Following from the recovery of North Korea's economic decline, the military first policy, Songun, began to enter the ideological sphere of Juche in the final years of the 20th century, largely as a reaction to North Korea's precarious international presentation on the world stage in the wake of the famine. Songun was initially launched under the Kim Jong-il regime and largely enforced by the Kim Jong-un regime by the 21st century, from which the grandeur of military parades and missile launches are the visual results. Songun as a military first principle, however, was by no means an entirely new proposal, but rather simply a developed extension of already existing military-orientated institutions. The separation of Juche from Marxism-Leninism ultimately sought to establish a uniquely Korean historical genealogy between the people, the state, and its guiding ideology. The spirit of revolution could no longer be conceived outside of the limits of the state and its ruling bureaucracy. The eternal legacy of Kim Il-sung is the revolution, and the revolution is nothing more. In addition to modern influences, Juche's inherent binding to the Korean people's culture, land, and history was largely cultivated through the adoption of familiar traditional philosophies, most notably Confucianism, and to lesser extents, Chondoism and Christianity. Such religious and philosophical systems have contributed to the history and culture of the Korean people over the various centuries, providing a sense of cultural and collective importance which significantly outdates the modern influences of Marxism-Leninism. The most crucial traditional element to the development of Juche has been the revival of Confucian hierarchy, which has historically legitimized the notion of the sovereign to be endowed with the mandate of heaven, which in other words has provided a metaphysical basis to rulership over the masses in pre-modern Asian dynasties. It is from this peculiar integration of pre-modern dynastical statecraft along with modern revolutionary thought that the North Korean state emerges in political religion. Confucianism was the ruling state ideology of the Joseon dynasty for most of its existence from 1392 until 1897. Whilst initially adopted from the Chinese Han dynasty of the 1st century BCE, Confucianism reached its theoretical peak in the Korean peninsula several centuries later in the 16th and 17th centuries. Confucianism as a state ideology played a crucial role in education and ethical training, which were mandatory processes for those involved in state bureaucracy. Two notable Confucian scholars of the Joseon dynasty in the 16th century included Yi Wang and Yi Yul Gok, who both emphasized the importance of moral education for fulfilling one's collective role in society and for suitably ruling the people in a harmonious relationship. The ideal of individual Confucian moral accomplishment is that of the sage man who engages in moral self-cultivation and practices it for the greater collective good of society. A profound ethical component to the practice of Confucianism is the notion of which man is at the center of the universe and that man alone is responsible for maintaining the harmony in the phenomenal world. The duty for individualized internal and society-orientated external moral self-cultivation are two means of affirming what Confucius called inner sage, outer king. The inner process of self-cultivation is linked to notions of nurturing one's heart-mind, a Confucian notion of human cognition that does not quite exist in Western philosophy. Whereas the outer process of self-cultivation consists of establishing a harmonious order between one's family and the country. For the Joseon philosophers, Yi Huang and Yi Yul Gok, such internal and external processes of self-cultivation were complementary, as such processes constituted sage learning. Importantly in Korean Confucianism, sage learning results in the systematized interpersonal practice of ethical conduct through self-cultivation and the governing of others. As ethical theories are put into practice and exemplified by Confucian sages throughout society. Whilst applicable to all people, Confucian principles were initially established for the ruling class of society, and in particular, the ruler of such society. The systemic relationship of Confucian conduct to the masses could be seen across all sectors of Joseon society, ranging from the family and village to the state institutions of the civil service and military. A cohesive part of this interpersonal system which underpinned feudal Joseon society was the Confucian notion of the five bonds, 
which inform the structure of social relations. The five bonds encompass the relationship of ruler and subject, father and son, elder brother and younger brother, husband and wife, and friend and friend. Whilst the five bonds informed one's place in society and the duties one must perform, the relationships were also profoundly hierarchical and patriarchal, providing greater power to those of a specific age, gender, and social standing. Social subordination to the interests of a hierarchical other was perceived for centuries as a part of the natural order of society. As the Korean studies scholar Kyung-hae Park states with regards to Confucian gender relations in her article, Women and Revolution in North Korea, that in traditional Korean society, women lived under a social system where kinship and patriarchal orders dictated their daily lives. Before the Joseon dynasty, when Neo-Confucianism was adopted as the official ideological basis of social organizations, women appeared to have had more freedom and legal rights and to have enjoyed a higher status although this does not mean that women were treated as equals by men. Regarding the Korean peninsula as a whole, Chung stresses that Confucian culture ruled supreme during the 500 years of the Joseon dynasty, and ethical values regulated everyday behaviors and exerted enormous influence upon thought and livelihood. Korean acceptance and adherence to Confucianism was nearly complete, and the Koreans of Joseon did not recognize any other political and social ideologies. Confucian culture generated authoritarian particularities in political culture, and such authoritarianism influenced the formation of the political culture in North Korea in important ways. Whilst Confucianism played a prominent historical role in the formation of society across the Korean Peninsula, the decline of China and the introduction of Western thought, particularly towards the end of the 19th century, challenged the Confucian norms which had largely remained unbroken for several centuries on the Korean Peninsula. Western colonial intervention in Asia was also presenting itself as a threat to the sovereignty of the Joseon dynasty, which further spurred questions on the capabilities of the Joseon state to protect its sovereignty from modern imperialist powers. The Dong Hak movement, also referred to as Eastern Learning, was conceived from such anxieties regarding modern imperialism and the inefficiency of dynastical governance and lingering feudal relations. The Dong Hak movement sought to counter Western influence through integrating Confucianism and other Korean philosophies together with modern Western ideals in attempts to modernize the Joseon state. By the end of the 19th century, the Dong Hak movement, which was largely led by members of the Joseon peasantry against exploitative state power, culminated in the Dong Hak Peasant Revolution, from which peasant revolutionaries initiated armed rebellion against both the Joseon state and the Japanese Empire in 1894. As historian Seihi Yu establishes, small-scale rebellions erupted in more than 90 places in southern Korea in the late 19th century, culminating in a major revolt, the Tonghak Rebellion of 1894. At first, these uprisings centered mainly on socio-economic grievances, such as the exploitation of the peasantry by the ruling class of the Joseon dynasty. But later, peasant anti-foreignism was also a factor. The peasants saw in foreign, i.e. Japanese, influence the basic cause of the corruption of the government officials, the factional struggles among the elite, and the financial bankruptcy of the central government, all of which, they thought, resulted in the endless exploitation of the peasantry. Indeed, the peasants came to feel that influence directly when Japanese troops were brought in at the request of the feeble Korean government to help quell the Donghak Rebellion. Prior to the establishment of Donghak, the introduction of Christianity brought forth from Western missionaries throughout the 19th century additionally challenged Confucian perspectives and social norms. The influence of Western Christianity provided new methods of social organization and new forms of individual self-actualization, which in most instances did not necessarily correspond to the Confucian hegemony over Joseon society. With the growth of both Catholic and Protestant churches on the Korean peninsula, missionaries extended their institutional structures into the domains of medicine and modern education to ensure biblical literacy throughout the Korean Christian population. In particular, Christianity appealed largely to Korean women, who had historically been forbidden the access to education, which was strictly reserved for men of higher social standing serving in positions of administration. 
The modern education of missionary institutions provided Korean women the ability to acquire new skills, social mobility, and to be more self-reliant in society outside of the traditional patriarchal family structure. Confucian ideology, which was firmly entrenched in the Joseon dynasty, severely restricted women's freedom. Men and women were segregated from the age of seven. Men stayed in the outer part of the house while women stayed in the inner part. Adhering to a rigid social hierarchical order based on age, sex, and class, the society encouraged women to follow Confucian ideals and to attain Confucian virtues. A virtuous woman obeyed men throughout her life. In youth, she obeyed her father. When married, she obeyed her husband. If her husband died, she was subject to her son. During the 19th century, however, various movements influenced changes in the traditional social system. New schools of thought such as Shilhak, Practical Learning and Tonghak, Eastern Learning, coupled with Western influence through Christianity, attached their primary concern to human rights and the equality of people regardless of social class or gender. They advocated the improvement of women's status and universal education for both men and women. One of the most renowned missionary institutions still standing to this day is Iwa Women's University in Seoul which was founded in 1886 by the American missionary named Mary Scranton. Korean men associated with the Christian missionaries and independence movement were also advocates for women's education. Male Korean independence activists So Chi Pil and Yun Chi Ho advocated for women's liberation through their independence association and through their non-governmental newspaper called Independence Newspaper. Many Korean women who received modern education would later become active participants in the Korean independence movement as represented with the founding of the first Korean feminist organization called the Chanyang Society, which was formed in 1898, issuing the first declaration of women's rights in Korea. Modern notions of feminism played a notable role to counter Confucianism in late Joseon society. As the historian and Asian studies scholar Donald Baker states, Korean Christians, especially in the first decade of the 20th century, were more likely to receive a modern Western education than other Koreans were. It is only to be expected, therefore, that they would take the lead in reshaping Korea to make it a better fit with the modern world. The influence of Christianity additionally constructed greater understandings for the political notions of egalitarianism, democracy, and autonomy. For many Koreans associated with the independence movement, the adoption of Christianity became an expression of nationalism and modernity, as it was perceived as an alternative value system in contrast to outdated Confucian traditions and colonial Japanese society. As much as Christianity played a prominent role in reshaping Korean society in the late 19th century, the religious engagement from the Korean population reflect values that are deeply rooted in Korean society, from the emphasis of educational cultivation to the crisis of national autonomy. Such applications of the religion reflect the ways in which the Korean population shaped Christianity to their own cultural and social needs. The influences of the Donghak movement and Christianity respectively altered the awareness of the Korean people to the more adverse attributes found within Confucian society. In other words, the Korean people ultimately became more conscious of their own subordination towards the end of the 19th century. By the turn of the century, Confucianism would face further scrutiny and questioning following the imperial encroachment of the Japanese Empire on Korean soil. Korean intellectuals who spoke out against Confucianism in favor of modernization included Yun Chi Ho and Yi Kwang Su, who would both later become active members of the Korean independence movement as a result of Korea's incorporation into the Japanese Empire in 1910. Although Yi Kwang Su would abandon the independence movement in favor of colonial collaboration towards the end of his life. The more liberal state-orientated branch of the independence movement was contrasted by the socialist faction of the independence movement, which were significantly influenced by the historic events of the Russian Revolution and the founding of the Soviet Union on the principles of Marxism and Communism. The socialist faction provided a strictly materialist analysis on the remnants of feudal Confucian hierarchy and the later Japanese colonial system. Then militant revolutionary soldier Kim Il-sung and his extended family were a part of this bloc. More profoundly anti-state factions within the independence movement included the anarchist faction. Active members of the anarchist faction included Sin Che ho and Kim Chua jin who both played a prominent role in establishing anarchist thought on the Korean peninsula. A underlying and unifying feature of the Korean independence movement was that Confucianism on the Korean peninsula either had to be reformed or abolished. As Korean independence activist, Kim Gu declared, 
Confucianism is incapable of advancing on its own, and this incapability is inherent in its roots. Following the establishment of the Provincial People's Committee of North Korea in 1946, as the proto-North Korean state, the new revolutionary government sought to integrate modern feminist ideals with Marxism-Leninism in attempts to abolish the remnants of Confucian hierarchy upon women in society. In May 1946, Kim Il-sung addressed the newly formed Socialist Women's Union of Workers, from which he declared, in order to achieve complete emancipation for women and provide them with equal rights with men, we must eradicate the remnants of Japanese imperialism and feudal conventions and build a truly democratic society. Bringing about women's social emancipation and sex equality is a part of the anti-imperialist, anti-feudal democratic revolution. In contrast to the centuries of Confucian hegemony over the lives of women in the Korean peninsula, the emancipation that occurred within the early years of the proto-North Korean state ushered in profoundly revolutionary changes to the conduct of Korean society. Following the expulsion of the Japanese Empire from Korea, Kim Il-sung initiated the campaign to redistribute formerly private land to the landless peasantry in March 1946. Such reforms included female members of the Korean peasantry, who were granted equal allotments of land and were capable of owning land in addition to their male counterparts. Furthermore, female workers in the sector of heavy industries were provided with women's rights in the workplace. The labor laws prescribed the rights of mothers and pregnant women, including 77 days of maternity leave with full pay, paid baby feeding breaks during work, a prohibition against overtime or night work for pregnant or nursing women, and the transfer of a pregnant woman to easier work with equal pay. In addition, the law on nationalization of essential industries, which began the elimination of private property, weakened the economic power of a patriarch. In 1947, North Korea abolished the family registry system based on male lineage, replacing it with a new citizen registry system. Considering that South Korean women's organizations have failed to abolish the system in spite of their arduous struggle against it for almost three decades, the leaders of North Korea appear to have been strongly committed to the abolition of the feudal family system. In early North Korean society, however, Confucian notions of gender relations were still broadly pervasive throughout the social thought of many North Korean men who actively resisted and spoke out against the political freedoms of women to vote in the first election of 1948. Kim Il-sung, in response, delivered numerous speeches on the revolutionary importance of women's emancipation and launched extensive programs to abolish women's illiteracy and to inform women on their newly found rights. The communist revolution sought to change the traditional social structure and liberate those oppressed under it. North Korean leaders incorporated this task into the regime formation process. Since as early as 1946, North Korea has instituted various policies regarding women's emancipation. These policies seem to aim at three basic goals, liberation from the patriarchal family and social systems, liberation through social labor, and the creation of a socialist woman. The most progressive change in the traditional position of women was the law on sex equality, announced on July 30, 1946 intended to transform the old feudal relations of the sexes and to encourage women to participate fully in cultural, social and political life. The law emphasized equal rights in all spheres, free marriage and divorce, and equal rights to inherit property and to share property in case of divorce. It ended arranged marriages, polygamy, concubinage, the buying and selling of women, prostitution and the professional entertainer system. For the first time in history, women were placed on an equal footing with men. In the late 2010s, the Korean American Historical Society conducted various interviews with elderly Korean Americans on their experiences during the Korean War. One such interview was conducted with the Korean American author named Robert Young Chang Kim, who recalls the South Koreans' public's initial reception of the invading North Korean army during the first Battle of Seoul in June 1950. Only four days after the Korean War had begun, Kim found Seoul filled with North Korean tanks and troops. But more interestingly, he witnessed a lot of girls, high school girls, college girls, shouting to welcome North Korean soldiers into the city. Kim's amazement regarding the number of girls celebrating the North's victory is fascinating, as it suggests that this was out of the ordinary. Kim's observation verifies, to some degree, the claim that some women in Seoul were impressed and interested in North Korea's policies regarding gender equality.
Women's emancipation, however, would not last long in the North Korean state, as it would later be eclipsed by a return to social conservatism and a hybrid form of Confucianism adjusted to the modern governance of the Workers' Party of Korea towards the end of the 20th century. Confucianism never really left the two Korean states, even during their respective modernization efforts, as Confucianism was so well embedded into the very social fabric of Korean thought and life for centuries prior. Even to this day, modern variations of Confucianism still inform the everyday interactions of both North and South Korean societies. In the case of North Korea, the economic decline towards the end of the 20th century and the subsequent North Korean famine only accelerated such Confucian revivalism. Whilst the North Korean state embarked on a revolutionary counter-Confucianism in the early years of its formation, Confucianism in its totality, however, was not completely expunged by the governing class, but rather certain Confucian ideals were reshaped and integrated during the configuration of Juche ideology. One of these Confucian ideals which appealed to the greater intellectual and governing classes was the notion of man being at the center of the universe in equal partnership to heaven and the individual's capacity for moral cultivation upon the model of heaven. As the Korean social scientist Park Sun Dok specifies, man is regarded as the highest of all the elements that make up the universe. Humans are seen as the inevitable outcome of the logic of continuous development of matter. As material beings, humans also form a part of the material world. They also have many common features that a material being has, especially as organic and live beings. Humans have a lot of common features with animals. However, commonalities with the animals do not explain the position humans occupy in the material world. Above all, humans came to occupy the highest position in the material world over the animal world by becoming a social being. In addition to aspects of Marxist thought, the anthropocentric framework on nature and the placement of humanity at the center of the universe as a result of mankind's endowment with ethical features in contrast to other biological entities can be traced back to the Confucian philosophers of Mencius and Zhu Xi and their perspectives on human nature. Men and other matters are likewise born into the world. Looking at Qi, energy, there seems to be no difference between them. Looking at Yi, morals, the fact that men are born with human virtues differentiates them from other matters. Humanity does not have evil characteristics, making men the lord of all creation. Providing a paradigm for humanity to understand itself and its grand place in the universe, Confucian humanism was appropriated by the North Korean leadership and ratified alongside Marxist-Leninist ideals, ultimately setting the foundations for Juche's distinct Korean orientation. The Juche idea is a new philosophical thought which centers on man. As the leader said, the Juche idea is based on the philosophical principle that man is the master of everything and decides everything. The Juche idea raised the fundamental question of philosophy by regarding man as the main factor and elucidated the philosophical principle that man is the master of everything and decides everything. That man is the master of everything means that he is the master of the world and of his own destiny. That man decides everything means that he plays the decisive role in transforming the world and in shaping his destiny. Whilst anthropocentrism is certainly not restricted to Confucian philosophy alone, clear signs of Confucian humanism are pervasive across Juche thought, informing the notion that man is the one who holds the power of creation over all other aspects of life and acts on this creation as a part of a cohesive social group and not as an isolated individual. During the early formational years of the North Korean state, the Confucian philosopher He Huang was initially disregarded as regressive and feudal. However, towards the end of the 20th century, North Korean intellectuals sought to reintegrate He Huang's traditional Confucian statecraft as practiced throughout the pre-modern Joseon dynasty. He Huang's Confucian conception of the state recognized the ruling class as a social body with the monarch as the head of state, whilst officials represent the monarch's chest and the commoners are its eyes and ears. The organic theory of state power was later developed by Kim Jong-il towards the end of the 20th century, from which the earliest signs of political religion can be emphasized from the notion of the state as a socio-political organism. The political and ideological might of the motive force of revolution is nothing but the power of a single-hearted unity behind the leader, the party and the masses. In our socialist society, the leader, the party and the masses throw their lot with one another, forming a single socio-political organism. The consolidation of blood relations between the leader, the party and the masses is guaranteed by the single ideology and unified leadership. 
This conception of leadership would be alien to the likes of Lenin and certainly Marx, deeming it the most significant deviation from orthodox Marxist-Leninist theory. In contrast to Lenin's theories on the relationship between the party and masses, Juche ideology expresses a metaphysical and almost religious binding of state power. With the introduction of the principle of Suryong, the supreme leader which is endowed with the moral responsibility to rule the masses, additionally possesses the approval of heaven. The natural harmony and cosmic order of the material world can only be maintained through the unconditional leadership of the supreme leader and the masses have only to work within the supreme leader's command to attain the fruits of this world. No longer is the relationship of class struggle strictly between a workers' party guiding the people towards revolution, but rather is a relationship of largely dynastic deification and acceptance of seemingly natural hierarchy. As Kim Il-sung reaffirmed in his New Year's address to the nation in 1992, I take great pride in and highly appreciate the fact that our people have overcome the ordeals of history and displayed to the full the heroic metal of the revolutionary people and the indomitable spirit of Juche Korea firmly united behind the party. No difficulty is immonstrable nor is any fortress impregnable for us when our party leads the people with the ever victorious Juche orientated strategy and tactics and when all the people turn out as one under the party's leadership. The binding of the leader, party and people into one holistic whole is crucially related to the Confucian understandings of loyalty and familial piety. The perception of the supreme leader as a divine natural force and father figure to the nation is notably reinforced throughout all sectors of North Korean life. Through the lens of Juche, the established hierarchy is the national destiny of the leader and the people. Only through submission alone to the collective whole of state power can one ensure the destined success of the revolutionary struggle. Although the revolutionary potential for the workers to control the means of production at this stage in the development of the North Korean state is sufficiently implausible especially if we consider the writings of Karl Marx. Religious suffering is, at one and the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. Whilst Juche is formally declared ideologically materialist, secular, scientific and atheistic, it has nonetheless acquired a metaphysical and religious dimension. As Gentile describes, a religion of politics is created every time a political entity such as a nation, state, race, class, party or movement is transformed into a sacred entity, which means it becomes transcendent, unchallengeable and intangible. As such, it becomes the core of an elaborate system of beliefs, myths, values, commandments, rituals and symbols and consequently an object of faith, reverence, veneration, loyalty and devotion for which, if necessary, people are willing to sacrifice their lives. The resulting religion of politics is a system of beliefs, myths, rituals and symbols that interpret and define the meaning and end of human existence by subordinating the destiny of individuals and the collectivity to a supreme entity. Additionally, Juche is by no means a eschatological religious system in the same vein as Jewish or Islamic traditions are with a distinct set of theological beliefs, rituals, holy texts and places of worship. Rather, the North Korean ruling class utilize symbolic state rituals such as military parades and funerals to conjure the emotions of veneration towards the supreme leader. Juche thought explicitly denies the existence of a god and superstitious beliefs yet spiritual qualities are nonetheless derived from the writings of Kim Jong-il. The physical life of an individual person is finite, but the integrity of the masses rallied as an independent socio-political organism is immortal. The great leader, comrade Kim Il-sung, clarified for the first time in history that there is a socio-political integrity distinct from the physical life of individuals. An immortal socio-political integrity is inconceivable without the existence of the socio-political community which is the integrated whole of the leader, the party and the masses. Only when an individual becomes a member of this community can he acquire immortal socio-political integrity. Immortality in Juche ideology represents the eternal unbroken legacy of revolution as preserved through collective engagement in the life of state power and rituals. Immortality cannot be achieved in an individual sense, but when the masses surrender their autonomy 
to that which is greater than themselves, in this case the supreme leader and state, the masses through cohesive socio-political integration can achieve an ideological immortality. Furthermore, state rituals of veneration towards the supreme leader have their origins in the sage kings of pre-modern Confucian dynastic power relations, who were endowed with the mandate of heaven and supreme ethical virtue. Kim Il-sung weaved Confucian ideals of statecraft into the framework of Juche in order to ensure the hereditary succession of his son, Kim Jong-il, who additionally furthered the cult of personality surrounding his extended family and established a sacred history through binding the political destiny of Kim Il-sung to the Korean nation and the Korean people. Juche ideology in this regard is directly aligned with the sacralization of politics and the notion of secular or political religion which Gentile attributes to totalitarian regimes. This process takes place when, more or less elaborately and dogmatically, a political movement confers a sacred status on an earthly entity and renders it an absolute principle of collective existence, considers it the main source of values for individual and mass behavior, and exalts it as the supreme ethical precept of public life. From Gentile's analysis, Juche ideology has attempted to establish a religious sense of state collectivism and salvation through devotion to the political destiny of Kim Il-sung and his heirs. State rituals come to simulate religious ceremony, state propaganda simulates religious iconography, and the apocalyptic vision of anti-imperialist wars for survival simulate the battle between good against evil. In keeping with the Confucian dynastic tradition, the supreme leader holds the ultimate command to actualize the revolution in addition to the needs and desires of the people. The working class party is the general staff of the revolution, and the leader of the working class is the foremost leader of the revolution. How the masses are awakened to consciousness and organized in a revolutionary way, and how they perform their revolutionary duties and historical mission, depend on whether or not they are given correct leadership by the party and the leader. Only when they receive correct guidance from the party and the leader, would the working class and the masses of other people be able to vigorously develop the deep-going and complicated revolutionary struggle to transform nature and society achieve national and class liberation, build a socialist, communist society successfully, and run it properly. The declared teleological destiny of the North Korean state towards the actualization of the revolution ultimately results in a totalitarian sacralization of the collective masses who not only follow, affirm, and internalize the vision of the supreme leader, but actively perceive the hereditary transfer of power as a necessity for revolutionary struggle. State power is therefore disseminated throughout every individual and every sector of North Korean social life. As the third article of the North Korean constitution declares, all activities are guided through the framework of Juche. Juche ideology, as it developed throughout the mid to late 20th century, did not appear in a cultural vacuum, but rather it largely evolved from a culture and philosophy that predates modern political thought on the Korean peninsula altogether. Despite the counter-Confucian movements of the late 19th and 20th centuries, Confucianism was unable to be completely eradicated and replaced. In the case of South Korea, Confucianism would come to merge with its authoritarian capitalist and later neoliberal capitalist system. Regarding North Korea, it merged with Marxism-Leninism and other modern revolutionary ideologies into what is now known as Juche. Whilst the Confucianism of the modern day is not to be compared to the Confucianism of centuries past, its impact nonetheless on the structures of individual and social life is still undeniably present across the Korean peninsula in various ways. In North Korea, Juche ideology is the primary regime of thought for enforcing the sacralization of politics and the sacralization of collective deference to state power, which otherwise does not exist in South Korea or in any other Asian nation for that matter. From such a collective cohesion, Juche ideology also stresses a shared sense of national belonging and national destiny. As the Korean people, land and culture are indisputably bound in a sacred history of guidance under the authority of the Kim dynasty. Juche ideology fulfills the criteria and definition of political religion as set forward by Emilio Gentile, who declares that a political religion must define the meaning of life and ultimate ends of human existence, formalize the commandments of a public ethic to which all members of this movement must adhere, and give utter importance to the mythical and symbolic dramatization in their interpretation of history and reality, thus creating their own sacred history embodied in the nation, the state, and the party, and tied to the existence of a chosen people, which were glorified as the regenerating force of mankind. Juche ideology is crucially an active ideology that has adapted to the society it seeks to mold. 
as seen with the restoration of Confucian statecraft to justify the eternal hereditary power of Kim Il-sung at a period of time when economic stagnation threatened his family's position within the state hierarchy towards the end of the 20th century. The ideological evolution of Juche is still an ongoing process as North Korea grapples with the coronavirus pandemic and military tensions with South Korea and the United States. Although one can reasonably presume, regardless of how Juche adapts for the future, the hierarchical power of the supreme leader and the state will likely never be challenged.